<laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I work in Atlassian, and Atlassian headquarters, as probably most people don't know, are in Sydney. So I, I hope I, I beat some sort of record for the longest travel here, straight from Australia. <laughs> So the um, topic of the talk is front-end engineering at scale. So let's just dive into it and talk about scale. And let's start with Jira. I hope uh, a few people know here, Jira uh, is a very, very complicated product. It's a team collaboration tool, and um, it's highly configurable, adjustable, and it's used by millions of people uh, around the world. So what we're currently doing in Jira right now is we're giving it a big UX update. We are rewriting this well-known, but to be honest, slightly dusty and old interface to this piece of design beauty. Much more fresh and polished look. But uh, the most important, uh, the most challenging part of this uh, endeavor is that Jira is really, really old. It started its journey in 2002. And I don't know about you, but I probably didn't even knew, know about the internet in 2002. And to, to, to 2019, if you think about it, it's 17 years old. We now have a whole generation of developers who are actually younger than Jira. This is fascinating. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, 17 years old in today's fast-pacing world, especially in front-end development part of it, as most of you know, is probably ancient. So Jira now is so old uh, that it can probably be used as a museum of web development. I wouldn't be surprised at all <laughs> if we can find absolutely any front-end uh, pattern or technology buried somewhere deep in some existential corner of Jira. So when this idea of big UX update and design update came along, uh, two years ago, people saw this as an opportunity to just uh, start completely fresh, completely new, and get rid of all this legacy jQuery and Backbone stuff. We wanted to free ourselves from the Java monolith with all the nastiness of JS, uh, JSP templates and stuff like that. We wanted to use completely modern web stack, and we wanted to just have nice front-end experience. And we kind of did. So we started a new repository with the only modern tech stack. So we use React, Redux, Observables, Babel, Webpack. We are on the bleeding edge. So it was so successful. Uh, people love it so much. They just developed uh, so hard in it. So in just two years, from complete zero, a uh, new, fresh uh, Jira front-end repository turned into this. We now have more than 1 million lines of code, more than 200 developers from at least five different time zones, and more than 80,000 commit messages. So when I'm talking about scale, this is the scale I have in mind. Uh, well, of course, this journey was not without its speed bumps and without its lessons. Um, so I want to share a couple of those uh, most important lessons with you today. And starting with the most important and uh, you know, probably the most obvious but still very, very important lesson is divide and conquer. Monoliths are not what you would want to have when you're dealing with scale. <clears throat> so consider this a very, very typical uh, Jira page. We, of course, can implement it as a big monolithic uh, application. Nothing will stop us. People, we are humans, and humans, for some reason, have this tendency to build huge monoliths. I don't know why. Um, but as you probably guessed, it will, in reality, it would look something like this. It will be a huge, unmaintainable monster that everyone will afraid to touch, and it, it will destroy absolutely everything on its path. So what we can do instead, and what we're actually doing in Jira, is we are uh, separating those pages into smaller apps. We call them apps. We can build, for example, this navigation as a, its own isolated app that deals only with navigation concerns, render only navigation data, and doesn't know about its surroundings. We can build this board as its own uh, isolated app that deals only with board concerns and doesn't know or care about navigation on the left. And when you click on an issue, we can show you an uh, issue view app that deals with only with issue concerns and doesn't know or care about boards or navigation underneath, which is a very, very cool uh, and powerful concept. 
So what exactly those apps? Since we are using Re React, as you can guess, uh, all those apps are just components. Sometimes they're very, very big, very, very complicated, but still components. So they all have a view. They all have uh, some sort of state, sometimes some optional side effects. What distinguish uh, an app from just simple component is that an app is an isolated entity that is clearly encapsulated and self-contained, and it communicates with the outside world through the uh, external well-defined API of props and callbacks. So as you would imagine, Jira front-end repository structured something like this. We have all those apps sitting uh, uh, closely with each other, and everything, everything is perfect. Well, in reality, of course, as you can imagine, that is not completely true. In reality, after a year of this well, eternal love from everyone and this growth and development, we found ourselves in this situation. We have 50 different apps and 50 completely different architectures, which is not cool at all, to, to be honest, but also it made the entire repository incredibly difficult to reason about. So you get used to one app, the way it does stuff sometimes weird, to its quirky path, and then you want to fix a bug in another app, and welcome to another marvelous universe. You don't even know where to start everything, it's just basically upside down. So instead of all those uh, nice, uh, nicely equally shaped boxes, in Jira front-end, we had something like this. We had apples, pears, <laughs> we had a whole basket of fruits, and even weird chicken leg hiding somewhere in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, this was a problem, of course, and we, uh, a year ago, we decided to fix it. So we introduced even a program that is naturally called Tangerine, uh, one of the main goals of this program was to uh, create some sort of unified architecture and apply it to all apps in Jira frontend. Essentially, what we actually wanted to do is to bring a bit of sanity into this fruit diversity situation. <laughs> uh, we wanted to get rid of this chicken leg and turn all the fruits into citruses. Uh, they still have different uh, sizes, different uh, flavors, they still serve different purpose, but at least now they have something in common. Um, and one of the most important um, concepts of this tangerine architecture, as we call it, is again divide and conquer, so separation of concerns. Every single app uh, will be structured in exactly the same way, and every single app will have uh, its own distinct uh, layers. So, for example, um, most of the apps, they will have at least two layers. They will have layers for views and layers for the state, and sometimes some optional layers for side effects, but let's not touch into that yet. So, for example, a uh, views layer, it will contain all the uh, React stuff, all the components, styles for those components, assets, and of course, all the tests and everything that is React. Basically, what you can render on the, on the screen, what you can see on the screen will go into the views layer. And other than just structuring an app into layers, every single layer uh, will also have very, very strict structure within itself as well. Uh, so views layer will be structured a uh, according to components hierarchy, and uh, this hierarchy should be represented on the folders level as well. Uh, so let's, for example, take a look at this uh, uh, screen. This is Project Issue Navigator, and uh, let's try to imagine how it will be structured with this Tangerine compliant way. Um, we will have some sort of, since it's hierarchical, we will have um, a root component that encapsulates everything. Uh, inside, we will have some sort of header that has um, title and uh, search bar and a feedback button. We probably will have issues list component inside there and also a view for the active issue. And if we look closely uh, in, uh, inside issues list, we can see that we can also structure it hierarchically as well. Uh, we can have a header here, uh, content uh, content area with the issue card inside, and also, uh, again, a footer. And as I said, all this hierarchy will be represented on the folder level as well. So our folder structure for this particular view will look something like this. Uh, we will have a view, 
uh, that uh, has issue navigator component inside. Issue navigator will have a header, issue list, and issue view. And issue list will have a header content and, uh, with issue card inside and also a footer. Uh, so, also the most uh, one of the important part here is that every single layer only deals with its children. It imports from children only, and it doesn't try to reach outside, and doesn't go through deep through its children. So this allows you to build a very very strong mental model of how your application looks like even without opening your browser. So you open your uh, folders uh, structure, and you instantly see what exactly is going on. And you, uh, you know what exactly belongs where. So this is very cool. But we, uh, again, we didn't stop here. And every single layer, again, we are structuring uh, strictly and exactly the same way. So every single layer will have index and Vue.js with presentational and connected components, and sometimes some optional files, like, for example, a styled for your styled components or messages for your translations. And as I mentioned, all of them will be structured exac exactly the same way. Absolutely the same story is for the state layer. Only it's also going to be structured very, very hierarchically. Only in case of state layer, we will structure it um, following a shape of your data, not a shape of your uh, components. And again, the idea is uh, this state layer is represented on a folder level, and when you open your folders in uh, your uh, IDE, you instantly can see the shape of your data in your app. So, for example, for Project Issue Navigator, we will probably have a state that looks something like this. Uh, we will have entities for actual data, and we will have some sort of UI. Uh, and inside those entities, we will have uh, separate branches for list of issues to show it in the project list, and also uh, details of the actual uh, active issue. <coughs> and again, same story as with the views layer. Every single one of those uh, layers will deal only with its children and also will be structured in exactly the same way. So uh, nodes that are not leaf nodes will be just combination of reducers, since we are using Redux. And leaf nodes will be where your actual implementation of your reducer for this uh, uh, node. Th that's where you will see your actual uh, reducer implementation. And again, everything is named exactly the same. So now we have uh, two layers state and view, they are completely isolated, completely separated, and we, even different developers can work in parallel on those two, which is awesome. But now we need to connect them. And since we are using Redux, this is very, very simple. Uh, we can just pull data that is necessary uh, into our views in exactly the same moment where we need it from exactly the same uh, tree, uh, tree of our data uh, with selectors. So, for example, in issues list, we will probably pull the number of issues. For uh, issue card, we will pull uh, name and key of this issue. And for issue view, we will pull actual data from issue details. And uh, when we want to sync backwards, uh, we would want to dispatch an action, again, Redux. So, for example, from header, when you click on this sorting, we would want to dispatch an action that sorts stuff. And this will uh, change something in the UI branch of our state. And if you look closely at all of this, you will see something really, really familiar. And of course, you're right. This is your classic flux architecture, unidirectional data flow, and we are very strict on that. <clears throat> so. We have this amazing architecture, which is incredibly thought through, uh, very, very complicated sometimes. Um, how exactly we can make sure that all our 50 or more, now we have more than 200, I think, apps are actually follow, following it? Because again, um, uh, if it's just one single team, we, of course, can uh, always talk to each other. We can always agree. Uh, it's just a matter of conversation. But when we have 200 developers from five different time zones, different teams, sometimes even different departments, it's much, much more complicated. And as probably all of you know, discussions even about minor stuff like tabs versus spaces can go on for ages. <laughs> we cannot afford all of this. Uh, so what we discovered is we just need to automate absolutely everything. Radi uh, radical automation is our 
um, basically path in Jira. We try to opt, uh, automate absolutely everything from when you start your app with code generators uh, through when you write your code with all sorts of static analysis and code formatters, then independent oh, uh, automatic branch, uh, automatic builds, deployments, releases, rollbacks, roll forwards, everything. If, it's, if something is not possible to automate, we're just trying to stretch the definition of impossible or possible and still try to automate it as well. So I want to briefly mention a couple of tools that are my favorite and that are at least connected to JavaScript. First and foremost, of course, YesLint. We are abusing YesLint uh, a lot. We are using absolutely everything that is available on the market. Uh, Airbnb, Prettier, all the standard configs, everything. Also, we are taking advantage of uh, YesLint pluggable nature, and we are writing a lot of custom YesLint rules that are doing uh, a lot of magic for us. So we are forcing uh, just style conventions, and we, uh, of course, all, most of our uh, rules are out of fixable, so it's not a problem for us. So, um, code conventions, how you name stuff, whether it should be uppercase or lowercase, it, all of this is handled by ESNint. Also, we are writing rules to prevent bugs and also even for communication between developers. Uh, so, for example, if you want to say that all our, our translations should have descriptions to have uh, our translation, translators do a better job, we can just force it with ESNint. Uh, since uh, all of our custom rules are out of fixable, uh, it's actually a very, very interesting experience to code in Jira front-end repository because you actually never know what you will get when you press save. It will look something like this. Uh, because of that, uh, your code behaves like a living, breathing creature that is, sits slightly outside of your control. And it's slightly weird at first, but, but when you get used to it, you're in trouble because you now cannot code in any repository ever again because this is so convenient. <laughs> um, so ESLint is awesome, but we also have uh, lots of other tools. So for example, Stricter. Stricter is um, a tool that was written in Jira for Jira, but is, it's open source and it's available for everyone. It's a generic tool. Stricter to your project uh, this is the same as ESLint to your file. It, um, it's a static analysis tool that operates on a project as a whole. It has access to your files, to all the contents of your files, and also to all the dependencies between your files. So just imagine the possibilities. And it's also pluggable, and you can also write your own custom rules for that, and of course we are. So one of the most successful rules that we love a lot, and also is part of a core stricter package, is a circular dependency rule. So circular dependencies are all those nasty buggers that can turn your beautiful code into a big ball of mud in a matter of seconds. Well, not in Jira frontend, not after introducing of stricter, because we can now detect all those circular dependencies from something as simple as this to something as beautiful as this, which is an actual screenshot from one of the older apps in Jira frontend before introduction of this rule, which is very cool. <laughs> Uh, also, remember all this beautiful uh, and very strict and uh, architecture that everything named exactly the same. We can totally write a stricter rule that uh, actually detects when we're trying to do something that is not uh, according to the standard, and we can just fail your build, and we do. We are very strict there. Uh, so, tools, they are awesome, but also one of the uh, very interesting learnings that are slightly different from tools is ownership. Again, when it's just a single team uh, that owns the whole code, that's, that's easy. But when you have uh, 200 developers, again, it, nothing is that easy. So I'm sure uh, lots of you know this situation. You have some sort of code that sits somewhere in the corner, just gathering dust, and slowly falls apart. Well, with our high pace environment, this slowly falls apart, can turn into deteriorates rapidly in a matter of seconds. We experienced this a bit in Jira, so we wanted to take it under control ASAP. So we developed a system of ownership based on what we call a manifest. 
Manifest is your basic uh, JSON file that contains all the information uh, about, uh, about an app, who owns this app, what are the rooms you connect them, all this interesting information. And of course, we are implementing um, rules that um, detect if you're trying to commit some sort of code that is not associated with any manifest JSON, it just fails your build. So no, no owner, no code, plain and simple. On top of that, we also implemented um, a bot that sits in our pull requests that is named Gollum. Don't ask why. <laughs> uh, Gollum is an awesome creature. It sits in pull requests, and it um, basically helps us with the ownership. When you try to uh, push something that do not belong to you or your team, uh, Golem will detect something outrageous as, and as that. It will read information from manifest JSONs. It will uh, assign uh, maintainers from this, uh, from this manifest to review your pull request, so no changes go unnoticed. Everything is under Golem control. Uh, <laughs> and last but not least, um, and OK, uh, I'll just go with this. We are hiring. <laughs> So Australia is the most awesome place to live ever. I love it so much. Uh, Atlassian is a very, very good company. And if you want to live in a place when you can actually hug a kangaroo, you can totally do that. Don't hesitate to apply. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you have any questions about life in Australia or life in Atlassian, feel, feel free to, to grab me after all of this. Thank you.